it is vital to secure the kind of work that we believe is necessary in order to have individual rights and freedoms. The populist movement we understood is a rejection of constraints of an organization and can be an articulation of diversity, but equally it can be uh, an articulation that asserts only a single national interest which then converts the notion of a rule of law to the law of rule. We understood that freedom can be lost democratically and that shaking off the chains of totalitarianism in certain countries has shown us that this does not necessarily bring about the democratic gains that brought about such revolutions. And so there are a range of strategies that those countries and those civil society organizations have adopted to take forward struggle in order to develop faith of individuals in human rights by advancing individual cases on the one hand, but also by engaging in every corner of the country to build up a much broader understanding and a broader alliance that supports civil participation and human rights and understands the agenda. And we heard that we need to earn our keep as civil society organizations only when we are recognizing that we have to ask the tough questions of our friends. We need to build consciousness to connect the dots and to reach new audiences. And if needs be, when the grounds for ind individual defense are removed, the regime itself will need to be challenged. And we ended with a recognition that the HCLU is a living proof that civil society organizations and non-government organizations will indeed outlive the governments of the day because of dedication, because of vision, but hopefully also because of alliances such as that of INCLO that will make the HLU and others know that you are not alone. So with that as a way of introduction, but also a way of thanking again HCLU of putting together a fantastic program, are there any particular questions and issues that people would like to raise as part of the concluding uh, panel? Uh, thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, really quick question, and I'd appreciate if all of you could answer this uh, briefly, but I see that there are some, uh, some overlapping themes in the, uh, in the work that you do in your respective countries, and I want to know how the economic environment of your country plays into your ability to sustain yourself uh, where you are working, doing what you're doing. And that, I guess, would also expand into like what the how taxation works, or whether there's any government uh, influence in the financing. Maybe some of you know uh, a lot about uh, what's happening today with a, a Norwegian. Uh, uh, civil funds uh, here in, in uh, Hungary. Uh, just a short note uh, on it. Uh, I just read on my uh, telephone and email that uh, the government uh, is uh, willing to uh, suspend the tax number of the uh, f uh, um, uh, organization that distributes uh, the uh, uh, funds of the uh, Norwegian uh, fund, so, so, so distributes the money uh, if it is not willing to um, um, let uh, the government, uh, government authority uh, inspection. So uh, this is not a direct financial, uh, this is not an answer, uh, direct answer, answer to your question because this is uh, not uh, the economic, uh, situ this is not on the economic situation of, uh, um, uh, of the country and the NGOs, but uh, I can say that uh, those NGOs who do not accept money from the government and uh, those institutions that are uh, related to the government uh, are affected by this very much because if uh, the funds that are independent of the government are occupied by the government, then those money will not be independent anymore. 
you know, from from our perspective, uh, the 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 challenges we confronted over the last five years um, have been pretty considerable. Partly because you had the perfect storm. You had the uh, election of Barack Obama, which to many liberals or progressives felt that the age of George Bush was finally closed. And then you had the economic crisis of 2008 that uh, affected the, the entire economy, including charitable giving. And so there was, a, there was that kind of that perfect storm where people thought the crisis is over and the economic challenges exist. And so we saw a very substantial um, impact on contributions. We had to uh, shrink our staff we went, we, we shrunk our staff almost by a quarter um, in that 18-month uh, period of time. And I would just say that from, from an NGO perspective, I think one of the things that we have to do as executive directors is to ensure the ability of the NGOs to survive difficult economic times. And it's often when the, the, when the economic moments or the economic crises come up is when there's often a greatest need for our work. And when we are relying upon wealthy individuals or foundations or even not our own governments but even foreign governments uh, contributions, um, it's, it's, it, we need to be counter cyclical. We need to be strongest when the economy is weakest. And that takes a level of financial discipline and planning that, uh, that I think is an essential part of a human rights NGO. I also think one of the most important parts that I've learned in my time is that to be truly independent means that we have to have a means of financial independence. That doesn't mean that we don't need outside money, but that we have to be very uh, aware that any one particular donor source um, can jeopardize that ability of independence long term. And so the, the need for thinking through not just amounts, but also diversification and the ability to, to weather these storms. Uh, you know, I will just say this. I, I've always said that the American Civil Liberties Union in the U.S. is one of our national treasures, right? It's an organization that for 94 years has brought the iconic cases in America, you know, the right to remain silent, uh, the right against, uh, the right for contraception, the right to a counsel in a criminal proceeding, the Defense of Marriage Act was our case. If the ACLU implodes Friday, we can cry Saturday and Sunday and then we have to get back to work on Monday because there is no such institution that will have that ability. And I think part of what is a responsibility for those of us who occupy these positions is that we need to make sure that we have the ability to say with a big smirk on our face that we will outlive you, Barack Obama. And we will outlive every president that comes and goes. There will be new occupants of the Oval Office, but there will always be an ACLU being a pain in the ass to every president that comes. And that takes a certain level of, of financial uh, rigor um, to be able to match up with that threat. So um, it's a good question. Well, I'll join him. Uh, this, uh, this is on the on the funding side. I, I just want to put on top of that that uh, this question of poverty rights, relationship of, of social uh, social economic rights in times of economic crisis, we usually have an increase in demand in labor rights and other poverty uh, rights as well. So there is a contradiction. You have less funds and you have more demand. I think the other issue is really around the perception of where the funds come from. And for those of us who believe in the importance of the independence, it's, it's not something that we can get funding from government sources. And so then the issue that arises is um, the fact that those governments that we hold to account and we put on the spot sometimes then resist the idea that we can be given donations. 
um, and not only from within our countries, but certainly from outside of our countries. And this then becomes part of the game that is played to undermine the resourcing of civil society organizations. The same countries, it needs to be said, are very happy to take you know, sort of all sorts of trade and other investment uh, in involvements with countries from all over the world without feeling that their independence is jeopardized. But when civil society organizations have that kind of, of support, somehow that's always um, held a little bit as, as though it could be a threat. And I think that it's a storm that we see, you know, as you see sometimes the thunder and the lightning comes and then the sunshine comes the next week. We know that then after sunshine, the storms and, and so on can come again. We know we have to ride those storms, but we are comfortable with the fact that part of our obligation as executive directors is not only to ensure the financial uh, freedom for our organizations to outlast presidents, to outlast governments, we also have to secure the way in which we operate so that we have an independence of political party interests and that what we are dependent on is being able to represent individual people in terms of their rights for freedom and for democracy. Hello, I'm Fonny from the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. Thank you very much for your presentation. Of course, I completely agree with you on principles with the funds, but I have a problem. I, I feel that there's a paradox between our survival and um, the facts in Hungary. Because, of course, we don't take money from the state, not even the European Union, if the decision is made in Hungary. So that's left out from the, from the picture. Then let's see external funds. The government is in the position to cut those funds on long term. That leaves us with the private donors. And uh, unfortunately, the Hungarian society lacks of culture of um, uh, human rights and the principles that we fight for. So I just don't see how it will happen because membership fees or individual donations I don't think will happen in Hungary soon, but uh, I know that we will do everything that we're capable of to, to make it happen. Um, I just wanted to raise an issue. I'm from Liberty, the UK-based um, human rights organisation, and I wanted to raise an issue which is really um, kind of at the forefront for us, which is a kind of public perception issue. So we're battling, as we always have done, at the interception between the state and the individual, but we're also battling with a kind of um, a backlash against the very concept of human rights, a real existential crisis for us. So we're constantly having to kind of fight this perception that human rights are about, the, you know, just about the, the, the terrorist and the paedophile and the, you know, these, these pop unpopular groups. And actually, the reality is we find that when we dig down into the individual rights that are protected in the UK, so when we ask people if there should be a right which protects freedom of expression or prohibits torture, people will say yes. But when we talk about human rights as a package, we find we've got something like, I don't know, like a PR problem, I suppose you, you could call it. Um, I just wanted to see whether, you know, the extent to which that's something which others are, are sort of grappling with as, a, as an issue. Um, I, I think there was one more hand, and I wonder whether we can take that one question so that we can then answer all the questions at one time because of um, constraints of, of time. I, I thought I saw a hand over, over here. Is there are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to the panel. Who wants to start? We'll, start. we'll just go around. No, sorry. Okay. So first, I think on, um, on the model of getting uh, funding. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always a bit reluctant in some of these meetings to, to, to share um, some of the issues that we confront the ACLU because they seem very much like first world American problems compared to some of my colleagues who really do struggle in situations where they are 
uh, under personal attack or under much more difficult economic crises. And, you know, I, I, the only thing I would say is that, you know, the ACLU today can largely say that if any one or two or three or four or five of our big donors stop giving us money, we would still survive, right? Uh, we lost our single largest donor who was a quarter of our budget uh, in 2009. And that's a moment of enormous contraction. But we are 94 years old. And we certainly were not like that in 1940 when we were 20 years old, equivalent to the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union today. Um, in 1940, we had a smaller staff than the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union has today. And so I think part of what is very challenging when we're in the moment and in a struggle and with real needs right now is to think about how do we make this a permanent institution. Um, and one of the challenges I think that often happens in the human rights community is that, is that other institutions don't ever think they will close. You know, it is, it is inconceivable that Harvard ever had a discussion thinking, what do we do when, if we have to close our doors? Harvard always expected itself to be around permanently. But somehow, if Harvard went away, who cares, right? There's Princeton, where, where I went, right? Um, but if the ACLU went away, there'd be a real gap in the world. And I would dare say it's the same thing with Hungary. You know, that, you know, there are great universities and great schools and great museums and great institutions, but there's one Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. And to not be too harsh on yourself, 20 years in, I think you're doing incredibly well. And then you begin to lay the groundwork for what can build your independence in another 20 years or 30 years. And I think some of the work that, you, that you're doing with online networking, with the, the need to reaching out to publics, and the bulk of the ACLU resources comes from small level contributions that all together add up to a lot. Um, that's a third of our budget comes from average gift of $50. Um, and we only are there because we've been doing it for 94 years. And so I would just say you have to th take a longer term uh, approach to it. You know, on the question around public perceptions, I mean, we work very hard, like I think Sharon was saying, you know, that you have to look at any little controversy and you have to denounce it because little controversies can become into big human rights problems. At the same time, we have to be very strategic around trying to move the public debate and picking the types of issues and clients that are not just the most unsympathetic or the most difficult to explain. And when, I'll just give one quick example. When we won our Defense of Marriage Act, which was the, the lawsuit to bring down the Supreme Court case uh, get, that, uh, that defined marriage as only between a man and a woman, we had any client that we could have wanted to, to bring that case. And we picked an 80-year-old, white-haired widow who had married her partner in Canada, who was well-educated, she was wealthy, right? Because her case was where if she had been married to a man and her marriage had been recognized by the US government, she would have paid zero in estate taxes but because she was married to a woman in Canada and not recognized by the federal government, she had to pay $380,000 of estate taxes. So now you do the math. If you have to pay $380,000 in taxes, you're not exactly indigent, right? Who cares? She was a wealthy, old lady with white hair who was brilliant client to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act, which helps every single American across the country, rich or poor, young or old, black or white. And so some of, some of the folks would have said, why did you take a wealthy widow who's 80 as your client to bring down this law, partly because you wanted to make it the most 
sympathetic case to otherwise a hostile Supreme Court that could easily identify with that type of client and bring a right to everyone. So I think we have to be very strategic as advocates in thinking through cases, clients, issues, and how we make the case that is not just for those folks, but it's for all of us. And that, that's our job as good human rights lawyers. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to pick out on the, on the issue of the, of the debate that's happening in the UK um, in relation to human rights and, and as almost as a conceptual thing. Um, and I agree with Anthony that there's a need to be strategic. Um, it seems to me that part of being strategic is not to engage the debate too intensely. Because when we talk about, you know, um, the, the sort of basic equals, you know, that people have got um, equality before the law. Now, if anybody in Britain can tell me that you've achieved that, then that will be fabulous, but I doubt that any of you will. You will say that that's the principle, and we try and hold everybody up to it. And where there are gaps, for whatever reason, that's where we push in order to get us further along the road. And if you begin to articulate the much broader framework of human rights very much in those terms, you then can be asking people in the British public, what's the problem here? Where is the gap that they are seeing? Rather than getting into some big intellectual argument about why there's this whole bigger set of rights related to what people in Britain can relate to. There's no case that we deal with in South Africa with a constitution that has all of the rights very clearly framed that can't be framed in the prism, within the prism of social um, of, of political, uh, civil and political rights. And I think that it's just a question of being strategic about how you articulate it and then holding up your politicians to see what it is they're running away from. And what they're running away from is European censure for when they can't uphold those basic civil and political rights in practice. And that's the kind of, 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 of um, uh, resonance that I think you'll have with the British public as you've been doing, I, I think, for some time. Um, and, and you can then point to the sort of solidarity that liberty has with others in the European continent.